Today's episode of The Bitcoin Show is brought to you by Mt. Gox, mtgox.com, and Bitcoin Bonus, bitcoinbonus.com, and Cablesaurus, cablesaurus.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Bitcoin Show. We are back today. We are uh, we have a very special guest with us. His name is Dan O'Connor, and he is running for U.S. Congress here in New York City uh, in 2012. Welcome, Dan. How Thank you. you. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> so, tell us um, how. Let's see. This is the Bitcoin Show, so it's all about Bitcoin. But I know that we have a lot of. Um, uh, similar synergistic issues and, and goals and things in mind. So uh, first, tell us about you and, and tell us a little about, about your story and then we'll talk about Bitcoin. Okay, sure. <laughs> um, well, first, thanks for having me on. Uh, as, as you mentioned, I am running for U.S. Congress here in New York City. Uh, it's New York uh, District 12. So mm -hmm. it encompasses parts of Queens, parts of Brooklyn, and also parts of downtown Manhattan, Chinatown, and it goes down and borders on, on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. um, so there are about 100,000 Chinese people in my district, and that's gonna be uh, my target. Uh, 100,000 out of how many people total in your district? Okay, so there are over 600,000 eligible voters mm -hmm. in the district, mm -hmm. um, but many of them are not registered to vote. Mm -hmm. And uh, of you know, the 100,000 Chinese people in the district uh, will be my focus as I, I lived in, in China for six years I speak Mandarin, uh, I also speak Cantonese, uh, and I've been covered by the, the Chinese newspaper quite a lot already. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is really cool, because we talked about this before that I, I lived in Taipei, Taiwan for almost two years, and uh, I know, I probably know six or eight words in Mandarin. <laughs> so I, enough to impress a, a waitress, for her to look at me and go, what? <laughs> they don't even understand, they're like, it's like a, a hearing a horse talk. They don't, they're not used, right? They're not used to seeing a, a normal American white guy Speaking Chinese. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and I've been living in Chinatown for uh, about a year now, and uh, most of the district knows me already, and I'm mm. running around, I'm talking to different store owners and shop owners, and uh, a lot of district already knows who I am already, and I, I get a lot of videos of myself engaged with the community, talking mm -hmm. to the community in Chinese, and just coming to better understand the, the people. Cool. Mm -hmm. So you're, um, you're a liberty-minded guy, and our audience, obviously, the Bitcoin community is uh, very, Liberty-minded, obviously. I mean, that's kind of a it goes like I say, it goes hands in hands with uh, the Bitcoin sort of, I guess, philosophy or whatever you want to call it, the hive mind. Uh, and you're running as a Democrat, and that's unique, isn't it? Uh, it is. Uh, it is unique. Uh, a lot of the Democratic voters and Democratic voters in general agree with a lot of my positions. Mm -hmm. However, there are certain positions of mine uh, that do not fall within the typical. Uh, democratic you know, political spectrum mm -hmm. uh, and this is part of what I'm hoping to accomplish in my campaign yeah. I am hoping to transcend party lines and mm -hmm. to shake up the political debate and challenge mm -hmm. the political establishment right. a lot of people in the country are sick of the Republican Democrat back and forth yeah. set views in the Democratic Party set views in, in the Republican Party yeah. back and forth um, most Americans are in fact sick of this yeah. and this is part of what I'm trying to accomplish in my campaign. It seems like a ridiculous game. You're either, you have to be on the red team or the blue team, and you might agree with one thing over here and one thing over there. Um, the, a lot of the important things they, everybody agrees on, or most, the majority agree on, but they have to be on the blue team or the red team in order to get elected. Exactly. That's the thing. In order, you don't, you're not gonna have any influence or power to do anything, to make any change, unless you're elected. And you're not gonna get elected unless you pick the blue team or the red team, right? Such a silly game that we play here. Absolutely. <laughs> With a two-party system. That summarizes it quite well, <laughs> Bruce, yeah. I want, you know, I, I had this thought the other morning was, um, I wonder if our founding fathers, like, uh, decided that there was going to be a party system in the first place and that there were going to be two parties or <clears throat> how that actually happened, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's actually a good thing you mentioned it because um, all of them were opposed to parties. Mm. Uh, specifically, uh, John Adams was the most outspoken against parties. Mm. Jefferson was very much against parties. Uh, George Washington was very much against parties. And as many of us know, the party system has evolved very much over the years. Mm -hmm. So 
the, t the, the modern day Democrat in, in, in America yeah. is completely different than what the Democrat looked like 150 years ago. Yeah. In fact, Andrew Jackson was the first Democratic uh, president and he was also the, f the only president to su successfully abolish the central bank mm -hmm. of the United States uh, in the early 1830s. In the early 1830s, he abolished the central bank? There yeah. was a central bank before that? He did, he effectively abolished the central bank and he, the, 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 the main way that he was able to, to, to succeed in that is that he drew attention to all of the corruption surrounding mm -hmm. the bank yeah. and all of the favors mm -hmm. of all of those connected to the bank and associated with the bank. And this enraged the people because mm -hmm. people, regardless of party line, yeah. people don't like corruption. Yeah. And coincidentally, I think this is a lot of what we're seeing nowadays in the modern or very recent uh, Occupy Wall Street movement. When we fail to learn from history, it repeats itself. Well, it repeats itself probably anyway, but uh, I didn't even know that there was a central bank before 1913 in the US. I didn't even, th is that how it was from the beginning? Um, in fact, the, the central bank was the, uh, the hottest uh, political discussion or topic in the first 1800, uh, first, I'm sorry, first 100 years mm -hmm. of American politics. Wow. And in the, the, the past 100 years of American politics, Hardly anyone discusses monetary policy. Mm. Hardly anyone discusses, you know, whether or not there should be a Federal Reserve Bank. Mm -hmm. But in the first, let's say, 30 or 40 years, this was the uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, they had it. They started with, with Alexander Hamilton mm -hmm. um, in the early uh, 1790s. Mm -hmm. And he, he was the biggest advocate or outspoken proponent of the central bank. Mm -hmm. And then Jefferson was the biggest uh, op opponent. opponent of mm -hmm. it, and he effectively abolished it in 1813. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, 1811. And it came back in 1816 with a 20 year charter. Mm. And when Jackson took office, this was the main part of his campaign platform to abolish the bank abolish it. because of all of the corruption that surrounded it. Wow. Sounds like history repeating itself. One can only hope. Interesting. That's amazing. So, um, we're gonna, you know, I'm, I may as well take this opportunity to, to announce because I haven't yet, is that um, we're going to be uh, launching two new shows. I already told you about it, but we're gonna launch two new shows here on Only One TV. One is called, uh, we're gonna call Global Central Bankers, globalcentralbankers.com, and that's gonna be a show specifically about the central banks of our planet, <laughs> and uh, you know, primarily the Fed, but all of them, and who these bankers are, um, uh, just kind of exposing to the world um, these nameless or faceless uh, mm -hmm. people. Who are these people? We call them the powers that be, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we don't, nobody really knows that, you know, really who they are. And they don't even know that they are the central bankers that are pulling all these strings. So we're going to do a, a show that's kind of like an uh, ex expose kind of mm -hmm. show outing um, these guys. Who are they? What are they, what are they like? Um, what do they control? How do they control it? Where do they live? How do they play their games? And so that's going to be a really fascinating new show called Global Central Bankers. So I'll probably want to have you back on <laughs> to talk about that because you're, you're very well versed in that. And another new show uh, called The Occupy Show because it's very apropos. I've been down to Occupy Wall Street, as you mentioned, um, like five times now. It's very, very exciting. The energy is amazing. One of my favorite uh, videos so far is when they booed Geraldo Rivera and Fox News right out of Liberty Square. Fox News lies, Fox News lies. Just go to YouTube and type in Occupy Rivera. Oh my gosh, that is just so, it's just so cool. Have, have you ever seen in the United States of America a mob of people booing a celebrity out and not letting them speak. I think it's great. Don't let them speak. They speak lies, get them out of there. It's like, ah, democ this is what democracy looks like. That's what they say. So anyway, we're gonna do a show called Occupy Show, which is gonna, we're gonna actually um, have people from the Occupy movement, the, the leaders of the different working groups come, we're gonna interview them here or there, whatever is more feasible. And, uh, and then also occasionally have people do a little soapbox about uh, you know, what their opinions are because everyone, everyone has a right to speak down there, except for Geraldo apparently. <laughs> but uh, anyway, well, they, they speak enough, we know what they, they have to say. So, so you've been down to Occupy Wall Street. Sure. What, did, what did you think, I saw your, yeah, I saw your video on, on your Facebook <coughs> page. 
So, uh, what was your feeling when you when you went down there? Like, what, mm -hmm. what was your perception? Sure, I went down for my first time on Sunday, just a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. and uh, it was fantastic. Uh, I don't think there's any way to summarize everyone's views because there is a huge assortment of opinions and views. Mm -hmm. But generally, it's a lot of people are just very unhappy with the system right now. Yeah, people are very unhappy with the economy. Uh, everyone has their list of complaints, and they come out and they voice them. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fantastic. And I think this this is where real change comes from in America, yeah. from the grassroots, right. from discontent, from people getting up and taking action. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very exciting. And for me, you know, with my district being right on the border of Wall Street, I'm definitely going to be be, be part of this. Yeah. And my opponent, who I I am challenging, is actually very entrenched with the banking system in general. Mm -hmm. She uh, consistently receives a ton of campaign donations from the banking establishment. So they keep her in office. Mm -hmm. And she also sits on the finance committee in, in D.C. And she receives, large, her largest donor is Goldman Sachs. <laughs> and, you know, she opposed um, a bill to audit the Federal Reserve Bank <laughs> so that people couldn't actually see what was going on in there. And she supported the bailouts. And... Bailouts are extremely unpopular. Democratic voters, Republican voters, the people are not happy with bailouts. And I think this is also a part of why people are down at Wall Street. Trillions of dollars being injected into the banks. Trillions of dollars being sent and shipped to central mm -hmm. banks globally. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, What's your opponent's name? What's her name? My opponent's name is Nydia Velasquez. Okay. And so, well, I can say one good thing about her. She's consistent, it sounds like. Very, <laughs> very predictable and consistent, if bought and paid for, maybe. <laughs> I mean, Goldman Sachs is a common denominator in everything. That, you know, what is that? I was just reading that... Uh, of, of the paper uh, derivatives or whatever, the, the paper gold and silver that they're flooding the market with to suppress the value of gold and silver, something they, they said that 80% of it, isn't it 80% of it is, is, bought, is, uh, is owned by Goldman Sachs and the other 20% is HSBC, only two owners, 80% Goldman Sachs, 20% HSBC. It's very clear what's going on. But the, the you know, and, I love... And, and coincidentally, you know, a lot of the recent appointees to the treasury the federal government mm. are very, very closely affiliated to Goldman Sachs, ex-Goldman Sachs employees. It's incestuous. They go back, I was like, they're just absolutely, in, not only in bed, but in bed making love 24-7, and they're going back and forth. They're federal employees, then they're private bankers, and then they're regulators, and then they're private bankers. They go back and forth, and huh. oh my God, it's totally incestuous. And it's a pyramid of, of power and wealth that, you know, I think the global central bankers are the ones on the top, though, because all of these, you know, if, if, you, if you basically uh, own every horse in the race, you don't care who wins, and if you, you know, if you, um, uh, if you can print money, then, you know, you have all the money in the world to uh, control everyone, starting with the President of the United States, the government, all of the agencies that come under that, all the politicians. And uh, obviously that includes the intelligence and the homeland and the military and everything there. And the private, the, the, the global corporations, not all corporations, not the flower shop on the corner, not, a, not your small business or main street shops. Those are the ones that are, that are the victims that are being put out of business. But the, um, the global evil doing corporations that we're all very aware of, aware of, they own and control that and, you know, pay off and all that stuff, right? So... <laughs> I'm, am I putting words in your mouth? I'm sorry. No. These are my opinions. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And, <laughs> and I think this is a lot of the sentiments uh, that are you know, being expressed down at Occupy Wall Street. And this has been going on for, for many, many decades. But mm -hmm. fortunately, given things like the Internet, more and more people are actually aware of it. Right. Because the mainstream media doesn't cover this stuff. No. You know, the mainstream media doesn't, doesn't mention where the, the, the actual uh, Federal Reserve came from. You know, the Federal Reserve... Uh, bank was actually created by bankers. It wasn't yeah. created by the American people. No, it's not part of the government. And I, I've, I've heard that there's a thing called the Federal Reserve Board, but and, and, and those people are appointed, but that has absolutely nothing to do with the Federal Reserve. They're, they have absolutely no authority over the Federal Reserve. It'd be like me calling, uh, starting an organization and calling it Boy Scouts of America board, and it has nothing to do with the Boy Scouts of America. Like, what? What is that? You know, they just, they use these words. Like, the word federal, 
and reserve that was very carefully chosen so that it would sound governmental and it would sound like a good thing. Reserve, oh, that sounds like a good thing. You're reserved, gas tank, you know, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. No, it's a bad thing. They should have just called it Walmart, which is what it is. It's just a corporation that's private. It is a global private corporation, right? I mean, it's just, you know, the, uh, and, and they really hold all the power. <laughs> But fortunately, more and more people are catching on to this and more yes. and more people are aware of it. Yeah. Um, things like trillions of dollars, biggest money printing spree in history, you know, these yeah. things help to bring attention to it. The mm -hmm. source of the problem, right. the Federal Reserve Bank overprinted and they kept uh, interest rates too low and they created the housing bubble. Yeah. And you know, some of us, you know, Ec economists actually predicted this mm -hmm. and saw it coming and now people are in retrospect are starting finally starting to realize and put the pieces together that yeah the mm -hmm. Federal Reserve did create the housing bubble this is why we are still uh, in a, an economic depression yeah. three four years now the government solutions did not work yeah um, people put their confidence in the government and the government's ability to correct the economy and people have finally accepted the fact that it failed. Mm -hmm. And then, but, but really it was all the power and control was on the Fed, the Federal Reserve, and that has nothing to do with the government except the, its control of the government. So yeah, it's just ridiculous. The, I, I'm convinced that that whole thing was uh, planned. I really believe that that was planned as a money grab because if you can, if you can just, if you, if you want to, the easiest way to grab people's money is to foreclose on them. So, you know, just to, to, to take their property. So if you just loan money out in mass to everybody, people that you know aren't going to be able to pay it back, mm -hmm. then it's just a, an entrap. It's a trap. It's an entrapment thing so that everybody can buy this stuff. We give you a loan and then we just take it back and now we own the property. And a lot of people think that the Great Depression was planned too. I mean, there were a, a, most of the banks were not members of the Federal Reserve before that, but afterwards, the the, the Federal Reserve only bailed out their members, mm -hmm. and then they could buy, you know, for pennies on the dollar, they could buy all the other banks, and now they're all Federal Reserve members almost. And and we just saw this in in the past few years as well. You know, the big banks got to gobble up the smaller banks. Yeah, yeah. Be and because they get, you know, J.P. Morgan gets $25 billion in bailout money. Wells mm -hmm. Fargo gets $25 billion in, in, in bailout money. Same thing happened with yeah. the savings and loan crisis in the, in yeah. the 1980s. Too big to fail. The, the and big ones gobble up the small ones. It's a system that works, and that's why it repeats itself. It's a, I think it's a 100-year plan. It's like, you know, it's just obvious that they, they sit around all day. These, these bankers, these central bankers are not stupid guys. They're very, very smart, and they, they do study history, and they know what works. They, they can, they, like, let's make a plan over the next 50 years to how can we grab up more, more wealth? But I, they, you know, that's what happens when people, and it's not just a few, I mean, there are just a few at the top, but I believe that it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you go down, and the, uh, there's too much greed going all the way down. People get too greedy, and they just push and push and push the people too far and that's what we're seeing now i mean you're gonna see you're gonna see riots in the street well we are sort of you know so so far the only violence i've seen is perpetuated by the police people are extremely peaceful and they're trying to uh promote yeah. mm -hmm. you know peaceful protest but we've seen the the police get very aggressive and quarantine people off and mace them for absolutely no reason innocent mm -hmm. young girls and um and even children arrested and you know trapping them uh and then you know arresting one by one, you know, more than 700 people on the Brooklyn Bridge. And, and then and the media, the mainstream media, which is corporate media, is owned by five guys or whatever that are owned by all the way up the pyramid. They, they didn't even report any of this. I mean, if they even mentioned it, <laughs> it, was, it was negative. It was like, oh, look at this, you know, a few hippies and this and that, and just making, joking and mocking and ridiculing them. But now it's growing and growing and growing, and now they can't ignore it. Exactly. And I agree with you. I agree with you that... From what I've seen, the people have been very peaceful, uh, and the people have not been aggressive. And I've also, uh, you know, what, what I'm also an anticipating is that the media will try to place one sort of group label on these people. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. it is certainly by no means a, a consensus. No. Similar to what they try to do with the Tea Party. Mm -hmm. You know, they try to put some sort of group label on the Tea Party. I by no means uh, associate myself with the Tea Party but I can acknowledge that there is a mixed group of yeah. opinions and sentiments 
within the Tea Party. There always is. One huge difference between Occupy movement and everything else is the direct democracy, the philosophy of the direct democracy thing. Because um, there, there's a, a broad variety of views, of course, but there, and there, there are some common denominators that come up more often than others, but the direct democracy thing, where they, they hear everyone and they, they vote on things by consensus every day, they, at least they have at least one general assembly every single day. And this is just like this beautiful thing that's just organically sprung up and um, not organized by any group or party or you know, whatever, they're, they're accusing, they're claiming, you know, who's behind it. No, there's, who's behind it is the American people are behind it, you know, and the 21-year-olds, especially the 21-year-olds. They're smarter. These 21-year-olds are out there and they are more, uh, they understand better what, how things really work mm -hmm. than uh, probably most of the 63-year-olds ever will because of the internet, they educate themselves on the internet. And I'm not talking about Facebook, I'm talking about the internet. The internet is, is the world's largest university. It's a self-service university. But if you're smart and you have time and you study the internet, you know, you Google, you can really, really learn how things work. And, and they are, these, these kids, I call them kids, but you, know, they're, they're, you ask them, they're 21. Mm -hmm. and, and they, uh, of course, not everybody is, now everybody's joining in, uh, but the 21 year olds were the leaders in this thing. And uh, they really understand how things work, so it's fascinating. I want to talk more about um, about your uh, you know platform and and also mm -hmm. about Bitcoin and how uh, you know your interest in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But I want to thank our sponsors really quick mm -hmm. first because of course without them we wouldn't be here. So um, thank you, Mount Gox. Mount Gox is uh, mtgox.com. Uh, very appropriately, uh, Mt. Gox has uh, something like 90% market share in the, in the uh, uh, world of buying and selling Bitcoins for normal currency. So they have something like 16 currencies that uh, you can buy Bitcoins in dollars, yen, you name it, every, almost every currency that's popular. You can buy Bitcoin for cash or cash for Bitcoin, buy and sell Bitcoin online from the comfort of your easy chair without, without leaving home. So um, uh, for very, very small fees uh, and super secure, uh, they've been around the longest and they have the largest market share. And we thank them for sponsoring the Bitcoin show. They also have uh, two part, what is it called? Two factor authentication fancy term, which means you get this little teeny tiny dongle thing that is on your key ring and it's a, it plugs into your USB port. So you log on, you can log on anywhere, a cyber cafe, the internet terminal at the lobby of the hotel, anywhere. Any computer could be full of viruses, doesn't matter because you log on with your ID and password and you have to stick in this uh, USB thing and it, you touch the button and it puts in a one-time use password that's only good for two seconds. Mm -hmm. So you can log in and do your account, your, your stuff you got to do on Mt. Gox and the virus can steal your password all day. It won't matter because they won't be able to log in again. So it's super, super secure, more secure than normal banking mm -hmm. and it's all about Bitcoin. So um, that's the place to buy and sell Bitcoin online, mtgox.com, mtgox.com. We thank those guys for being our sponsors. And Bitcoin Bonus. Bitcoinbonus.com is uh, the place for kickbacks. <laughs> you can shop online. <laughs> I shouldn't use that word with, with a, uh, um, a congressman here to be. But, uh <laughs> but anyway, if you, it's a rebate. If you shop online, who doesn't shop online, right? People are buying everything online now. It doesn't matter. Uh, you can go to what, like Amazon.com and Buy.com and every major um, online merchant that you go to, uh, right before you go ch to check out, go back to BitcoinBonus.com and type in the name of that merchant, find the button there. You click the button there and you order it through their link and you're going to get Bitcoins paid back to you as sort of an extra bonus rebate. Cost you nothing. It costs absolutely nothing. You get Bitcoins for nothing just by using Bitcoin Bonus, their referral links for all your online shopping. So check out BitcoinBonus.com and Cablesaurus. Cablesaurus.com. It sounds, uh, it's Cable, S-A-U-R-U-S, Cablesaurus.com. And they sell cables and they sell mining gear. They sell all kinds of peripherals and equipment. Um, and they accept Bitcoin, of course. So we thank Cable Soros for being a, a loyal sponsor as well. So, all right. So let's talk about um, your campaign. What, what's the, uh, you know, I guess, what do you stand for? What do you represent? Right. So, um, you know, as mentioned, um, it, it, my, my district is extremely diverse. Um, mm -hmm. Very large Hispanic community, Chinese community, black community, um, Hasidic Jewish community. 
and um, it's 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 quite exciting to be in New York City. Um, yeah. You know, in the heart of, of all the action, and you know, the, right there on the, in, in the uh, you know near the on the border of the financial district in the media capital of the world, and uh, to you know, really, basically, uh, my campaign is is devoted to the Chinese community. Um, mm -hmm. I want to enfranchise the Chinese people. What, are the, what, what how have they been disenfranchised? <coughs> what what do the Chinese people want that's unique or? Special, different. <laughs> well, my district has the largest uh, concentration of Chinese people of any district in, in America, mm -hmm. and it's the oldest Chinese district, you know, Chinatown. Mm -hmm. It's been there for a very, very long time, yeah. and generally, the Chinese people do not engage uh, in elections uh, mm -hmm. for the most part. Mm -hmm. And uh, but but there are a handful that do, mm -hmm. and more and more, especially mm -hmm. given the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the most important thing to the Chinese people: yeah. uh, the economy. Uh, the cost of living, right? Uh, empl you know, employment, education, and and I offer solutions uh, to these issues for mm. them. Uh, in employment, obviously, I want to change what what's been going on and and stop all of these solutions that we've been doing, and look at non government governmental solutions because the government solutions have all failed. Also, when it comes to the cost of living, the Chinese people understand that when the federal government or the Federal Reserve Bank prints trillions of dollars, their cost of living will increase. Yeah. And their cost of living has significantly increased in the past few years, sure. especially in New York City. Yeah. My district is you know, middle income, lower income families, and when they see the Federal Reserve Bank printing trillions of dollars, they know that you know, their goods are going are gonna to go up in, in price. Right. Uh, and it's hurting them. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, the other main focal point will be education, in which I want to introduce school vouchers, tax credits for mm -hmm. education, mm -hmm. giving teachers and parents more of a say in the, the children's education. So they can select their own school and, and, and have free market uh, uh, competition between schools so the parents can get a, give better education to their kids. Yes. Is that right? Give the parents more of a say. Yeah. Give the teachers more of a say. Yeah. Not bureaucrats. Right. <laughs> not politicians who choose the curriculum, who choose right. the standards, who right. choose the tests. And all the uh, money goes to the uh, bureaucrats instead of the teachers. Yes. It's like crazy. And the, the education system in the district has just gone down and no mm -hmm. one's happy with it. Yeah. So I want to empower the, the parents and empower mm -hmm. the teachers to have more of a say. Yeah. And rather than implying, uh, applying some sort of universal standard for such a diverse group of students mm -hmm. and, and children, which they try to do, yeah. give them more of an option. You know, mm -hmm. no, no universal standards. Right. Um, and this is the way New York City used to be. Yeah. And I, I think that from my, I gather that the, the Chinese community is not real hip on banking and, and uh, you know, in general bankers and, uh, or maybe they're hip to it and that's why they're not hip on it. Um, I, I remember uh, this anecdotally, I was looking for a safety deposit box and I forget what it was. I was looking for one that had long hours or something and the bank said well the only branch that we have long hours is in Chinatown mm. and so I called another bank and they said well the only branch that we have that has long hours is in Chinatown mm. every bank I called and I'm like what the, what the heck is going on with Chinatown so I said okay fine so I went to Chinatown and opened a bank a, a safety deposit box or whatever this was a few years back mm -hmm. but one of the things I accidentally discovered is that um, these banks in Chinatown have like three floors like 40,000 safety deposit boxes in each branch because the Chinese community, they just don't trust the banks. They're, they, they in, intelligently, they, you know, they don't trust the bankers. And uh, so I think that uh, Bitcoin actually could be a real good uh, thing for them to, it, when they discover it, I mean, they may not trust Bitcoin initially, they're gonna have to learn about what it is. But uh, we're going to be actually doing this uh, educational uh, basics of Bitcoin thing down mm -hmm. at the Occupy Wall Street every mm -hmm. Saturday, starting this coming Saturday. So that's going to be exciting. But so we're going to educate people about the basics of Bitcoin. Excellent. They actually yeah, contacted me and asked me to do a, vi a, a video about it. So I've done that. But mm -hmm. I'm going to actually go down there. We're going to do hands-on things about you know, teaching people what Bitcoin is and installing, helping mm -hmm. them install it on their laptops and their smartphones and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, um, so you're um, very liberty-minded. Running as a Democrat, um, the um, what do you like? Um, what are your feelings about Bitcoin? And sure. How long have you? I mean, like you, you, you're kind of new to discovering it, but what do you think about it so far? Well, first, just to, to comment on your point about uh, the Chinese people and their mm -hmm. distrust for banks. You know, you're absolutely right, and uh, 
Chinese people really, they, they trust themselves. They trust their families. Mm -hmm. They trust those people close to them. Yeah. But they don't, they don't trust the government to manage their money. Right. And they, they like to keep their money in, in deposit, you know, safety deposit boxes. And uh, they save money. They save mm -hmm. a lot of money. Big savings, there is yeah. no, uh, you know, government run uh, social security in yeah. China. So and they have to save that. money yeah. for when they're older. And it actually works. Yeah. Like they save money. Like my grandparents, they were all about saving, not about uh -huh. debt. And yeah. Americans are all about debt and credit, and you know Chinese people they don't they don't they don't like debt they don't mm -hmm. like credit they yeah. save money yeah and uh, I think there's a lot to be learned from that this is yeah. the way America used to be that's right <laughs> um, you know before things like Social Security were introduced mm -hmm. um, but uh, in, in terms of Bitcoin I think it's extremely fascinating yeah. I think um, the people I've spoken with that I haven't heard anyone that that uh, a single negative thing about it mm -hmm. uh, I'm very interested in learning more about it. Um, yeah. But it's my understanding that you know the, the 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 coolest thing about it, in my opinion, is the fact that it's completely decentralized. Yeah, the bankers don't issue it. The government doesn't issue it. Mm -hmm. They can't control it. They, you know, it's like zero transaction fees, effectively, and uh, irreversible transactions mm -hmm. and financial privacy. Mm -hmm. You don't need to get approved by anybody mm -hmm. to open an account or something like that. You can do whatever you want with it, and nobody can shut you down because they don't like who you're donating to or what you're doing with your money, mm -hmm. what you're buying or whatever. They, they, there's no, um, you know, like, like they're doing with the WikiLeaks. So they're, they're shutting down PayPal and MasterCard, Visa and Bank of America because they don't like you donating to WikiLeaks. Like, you know, like who, who's the government to tell you what to do with your money? So but there's no way like, to shut down Bitcoin though. No. No. They'd have to shut down the entire internet. <laughs> That's right. They basically have to, yeah, and, and how can you, you can't do that. Because they would have to actually, like, not only make it illegal, they would have to actually confiscate every computer and smartphone, and it still would only be in that country. They would have to do it, like, across the entire world. As long yeah. as two computers can connect, you've got a network, you know. Mm -hmm. they, there's just no way they can shut it down that mm -hmm. we know of yet. <laughs> so it's very interesting possible uh, possibilities of where Bitcoin's going to head. I think the I, I don't, actually the only problem I could see with Bitcoin is that not enough people know about it. That's right. Exactly. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. We're doing this. That's why I'm I'm going down there and you know volunteering every Saturday to to teach people the basics of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I think it's Occupy Wall Street, liberty-minded people. All these movements are mm -hmm. super synergistic with Bitcoin, and we need to the people who would be most amenable to it need to be aware of it. So that's why we're going to be down there with a great big huge banner that says the Bitcoin show and people are going to go, what is that? Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll be handing out flyers, teaching mm -hmm. people what Bitcoin is. And uh, of course, we're not selling anything. Mm -hmm. We're not, well, except for the show, but we're not selling anything, uh, you know, commercially. It's mm -hmm. just Bitcoin is a free open source mm -hmm. software project and uh, nobody makes money off of it, um, you know, off of people signing up for Bitcoin or anything, I suppose, unless you buy Bitcoin and the value goes up. But that's a good thing. I mean, it's like buying gold. The more people buy gold, that's good, I guess. But um, nobody's making, we're not directly selling anything. Okay, so for, for my friends or whoever uh, in here in New York, mm -hmm. where, could, where is Bitcoin accepted? Where can, where can they use Bitcoin? Yeah, there's a, we, we, I actually, I created a site called BitcoinMe.com, BitcoinME.com. Mm -hmm. And you can go there and you can learn all about what is Bitcoin. There's tabs across the top. You can learn what is Bitcoin. You can learn how the easiest ways to buy it mm -hmm. and sell it for currency, for dollars. Um, how to accept it if you're whether you have uh, you know uh, a restaurant or you're a massage therapist or whatever the heck you do um, you can accept Bitcoin in your business without asking anybody permission you can it's super easy to accept Bitcoin and then there's also a, buy, a shop tab that shows you all the places that you can shop and what you can buy there's you know thousands and thousands of places online there's uh, a one called uh, what is it called bitcoin deals bitcoindeals.com which is like a new amazon for bitcoin mm -hmm. they have over a million there's going to be a lot more but right now it's already over a million items that you can buy with bitcoin on this one website really slick really wow. good bargains too it's, we had him on spreading it's spreading really phenomenal. fast and also brick and mortar shops like the mezzi grill is, is one of our sponsors who's uh, uh, the world's first restaurant mm -hmm. to open to accept Bitcoin, they're at 50, what are they at, 51 and not 8, 9, 55 and 8, 55 and 8, <laughs> 55th Street and 8th Avenue here, at like three blocks south of Columbus Circle, mm -hmm. Mezzi Grill, and uh, they accept Bitcoin there. And they're actually now Hudson Eatery does, which is at 57 and 11, and what, uh, Oak Crepes and uh, Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and more and more, they're springing it up. There's another site called uh, 
bitcoinnavigator.com, is that right? bitcoinnavigator.com, which only shows the brick and mortar places mm -hmm. that sell Bitcoin. They'll show you like on a little pin map and it'll show you pictures, a whole, like a photo gallery of each place so that you can find them easily. So more and more are springing up all the time. So it's exciting. And the new software and applications are coming out, which makes it easier and easier to buy and sell and trade and exchange Bitcoins. On and phones as well now. Yeah, yeah, on the, on the smartphones, as well as laptops and stuff, yeah. Yeah, the smartphone's the key to it because mm -hmm. everybody has a smartphone in their pocket now almost. Yep. And the merchant can just have a smartphone sitting next to the cash mm -hmm. register and boom. It's like a credit card terminal, but it's faster and easier. That's excellent. And we're out of time. Oh my gosh, he's telling me he's going, oh my God, we're out of time. I can't believe it. See, so yeah, I told you, the time just flies by. So we're going to have you back on because I want you to be on uh, the new show, the, the uh, Global Central Banker mm -hmm. show. And then also we're going to be doing uh, the Occupy show very frequently. So um, I want to have you back on to talk about this Occupy movement again as things can you know, progress. Absolutely. So uh, yeah. thanks so much for joining us, Dan. Thanks a lot for having me Appreciate on. Appreciate it. Take yeah. the time. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and see you, all, you guys all tomorrow. Same time, The Bitcoin Show.